So anyway, I'm delighted to be here with you. Any chance I get to be with my home community is always a joy. And I'm especially thrilled because I came up with a great title. I don't know how many of you said, or how many of you are watching said, I, I got to see what the heck she's going to be talking about. That was, yeah, that was Rose. Because here's the thing, titles have never been my favorite thing. Some people just are great with coming up with catchy titles. Never been me. I always struggle. I labor. And I said, finally. And then I realized in, in, in June of this year, I will have been in ministry officially for 25 years ago. God, some of us really take a long time to get some of these things. I guess I'm the only one who thinks that's hilarious. But. <laughs> and then those of you who know me will maybe think it's really hilarious that I actually finished my talk early last time. So <laughs> miracles are abounding. Yeah. But that's probably not going to happen in this service. So I love the theme, everything is holy now. I just think that's the most beautiful theme. And what we're going to be looking at today are the areas in our lives where we, well, areas that we have excluded from the holy. Areas that we haven't thought to let God in. And I do have a little spoiler alert, or except for the teens, a reassurance. This talk is not really going to be about poop, okay? <laughs> oh my God, 20 people just got up and left. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. But um, I am reminded of Thomas Troward's idea that I know many of you have heard uh, Reverend Kathy Ann talk about over the years that we are centers of divine operation and therefore there is divine assimilation, divine circulation and divine. So there you go. So yeah, poop is divine. So, and a little more on that later, but not a lot. Okay. Not a lot. Today actually is the first day, and I want to acknowledge this, of Ramadan, which in um, the Islamic religion and tradition is a 30-day period of fasting from sunup to sundown, and even no drinking of water. So at sundown, which now is an hour later, thanks a lot, they're all saying, um, if they're in the U.S., uh, they break their fast with uh, feasting. And I don't know if any of you read the Seattle Times this week, but actually, and I hadn't seen this before, this is just a little side benefit, uh, that actually there are places where non-Muslims are invited to join in with the fast breaking, different uh, restaurants and stuff that are hosting dinners. So if that is something that, that calls you in a spirit of fellowship with um, our Muslim brothers and sisters and others uh, and siblings, our Muslim siblings, we'll get it, um, then you can do that. You're welcome to do that. So go to Seattle Times and I'm sure you can online, you can find out what that is. So this is a holy special time for the religion of Islam. And just in case there's anyone who doesn't know this, Islam means to submit to God. And so a Muslim is one who submits to God. And again, as probably many of you know, there are many rituals throughout the day, including, of course, the five times of prayer, calls to prayer, so that Islam has recogni recognized uh, since the 500s that God's in everything, that we do many things throughout the day to remind ourselves of God's presence, to turn to God, to let God in to all the parts of our day. 
And so it is, it is not only timely to acknowledge Islam today on their great um, feast month and Lent, uh, fasting month, but also for that kind of practice that already builds in. Because we in the West, we in the West uh, kind of compartmentalize God. Have you noticed? We have ideas about what is sacred and what is not, what is holy and what is not. And some of it may be what we were taught as little kids that, you know, like, just like this is nice, this is savory, this is pure, and this isn't. And without checking in, it's already in there. And what's one of the first things we do when we take a class in this teaching is we start looking, we start examining our thinking and our beliefs. Because without examining our thinking and beliefs, we don't realize what's running the show. And when we don't realize what's running the show, we'll continue to have the lives we've always had. And many of us come here because we're not loving the lives we have. So this is yet another opportunity to start looking at what are my beliefs? What are my thoughts about where it's okay to have God and where really, I, I don't want God to see. How many people have that, you know, the thing about Adam and Eve hiding their nakedness or hiding, hiding in the Garden of Eden? Because God's not going to find them there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But we have those. We have those. And so as I do this talk, I invite you to start looking at, and you don't need to tell anybody, but start looking at the areas where it's okay for you to let God in, where you routinely turn to God, and maybe where you don't. Because, of course, we turn to God in prayer, and those of you who have a morning practice, you turn to God then, and those of you who don't, start a morning practice. And now we know because of dawn that it's okay to turn to God at work, to bring God into work. I mean, thank goodness, you know, 25 years ago or so, people weren't kind of thinking that. It was like, this is God's part of my life, Sunday, and or Saturday or Friday, depending on your tradition. And then there's the rest of the week. But we're, we're, we're learning. We're waking up. And usually by the time you've got here, maybe even before you got here, if you have some big challenge, you know to pray about that. You know to bring God into that. So that stuff's all okay. But then we have a whole list of things it's not. Driving. Driving. Now, I know some of you have been in near-miss accidents where you realized God's presence afterwards, but you kind of jettison your compassion, your patience as soon as you get in the car. And then, of course, our little mirrors out there, very easy to see other people who certainly are not accessing God when they're in the car. Eating. Now, many of us were taught to say grace, and man, many of us as conscious people now reincorporate saying grace before we eat. But what about at 11 o'clock when you sneak into the cupboard and start eating those handful of cookies? You know, that's funny to some of us who don't do that. But for those of us who do that, we tend not to go, what's really going on here? What's, what's the hole I'm trying to fill? And more on that in a minute. I know, as I mentioned earlier, the bathroom, but really what I'm talking about is our bodies. Many of us were taught in old religion, unfortunately, much of it, the Christian kind, taught us our bodies were, were sinful. And not of God. 
big disconnect only our head been healing with that one when we party when we have fun well that's not God because God's serious you know thank goodness you're here because you've kind of been disabused of that notion but if you're new you may still be going really really God's not serious you know God loves goofballs that's why Kathy Ann and I have jobs um, sex oh again lots of us have healed have seen the joy of the beauty of and brought God into that but others again nope what about parenting you know again big problem yes but I think of as a new mother the day in day out tedium of mothering in fact here's a little full disclosure when uh, Kathy Ann called me to ask me if I could speak she said you know you're one of the few parents I know that I can get as a speaker and we're doing you know everything is holy now so I'd like you to speak I said great okay uh, what's the date and she said March 10th and I went uh that's not Mother's Day who what mother here does not know Mother's Day is in May you know and she said oh and she looked at her calendar she said oh it's Mother's Day in the UK <laughs> so we're all going what kind of world calendar does Kathy Ann have so and so just just a little again story about that uh years ago when I was going to see Beck, uh, Reverend Michael Beckwith was up, um, and he was doing, he was doing a meditation on purpose. And so I'm lying down on the floor with my knees up. It's evening time, so no kids program. So I'm going into, okay, what's my purpose? You know, I'm 34 or something. Well, no, I was probably 36 or 30. And then, oh, so I'm like, oh, what's my purpose? What's my only purpose? Then all of a sudden, mom, 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 can we, I go, you guys, you guys, it, it, this is, this is my time. I'm doing this meditation, you know, go. What's my purpose? What's my purpose? Mom, mom, mom. I go, you guys, come on, just, just go find your dad. Go find your dad. Oh, those kids are always getting in the way of me finding my holy purpose, my serious purpose, my God time. Mom, mom. And I went, okay, again, slow study, but I got it. So that's what I have to say about, yeah. So again, letting God be, that is, that at that particular time, that was my holy purpose. I mean, it still is. What about, and some of you have already clued into this, what about money? Especially when it comes that, that altar call of giving your gift at the end of the service. Are some of you still kind of clutching or during the annual pledge campaign, you sort of clutch and go, first, I, I don't want them to know anything about my money. No, I'll do it on this, this side now. No. Or, oh man, they're like all those other horrible churches. All they care about is money because somehow money and God have no connection. Money is not an area of our lives where we would want discernment, wisdom. You know, God doesn't reward us with money and we as uh, leaders within a community don't love you if you give more but how many of us really think God and money should not be in the same thing and then politics we don't talk about politics in church we don't want to think about politics in church it's not of God, except for those people over there who bring the kind of God we don't believe in anymore into politics. So we're not going to do it. So what are yours in there? What, what are yours? Some of these you probably go, no, no, no. I bring God into that all the time. So just 
Keep asking. So if we don't, the fact that we don't, when we don't, why? Well, I think that it's largely, and I'll go back to that, eating or anything that's sort of like an addiction that we don't bring God into it because we're ashamed. Because we have shame around that area in our lives. We don't measure up or we have anger. And that's, that's not a holy or sacred or good emotion. So we have shame or anger or just what I call icky feelings as if, and this is again where we examine our history, as if by bringing God into this area that I don't feel good about, I'm going to get judged and not judged in a good way, punished. We don't teach that here, but gosh, is that in a lot of our religious DNA that letting God into a place I don't feel okay about is going to get me spanked in some spiritual or mental way. And letting God in is where we get guidance, not punishment. It's where we get guidance. And I'm saying this for me too, guys. It's the hello, hello. So here's the truth to counter some of that DNA. First of all, Hafiz, who was a Sufi, which is the mystical branch of Islam, So again, timely and wonderful. Hafiz, who lived about 5th or 6th century, said, and some of you probably know this quote, now is the time for you to realize everything you do is sacred. Now is the time to realize that everything you do is sacred. No separation. Ever heard that word, separation? No separation. Ernest Holmes said this, when there is a consciousness of God, pure spirit, we are made free. Not we are made to feel bad. Notice that? We are made free. When I bring, Jack will tell us, you bring God into your addiction, there's a freedom that happens there. And for so many people who struggle and struggle and struggle thinking, I can't bring God into this. I don't know if I believe in God, but you know, it doesn't happen. The addiction doesn't get lifted. When we bring God into it, something happens. Maybe not in the beginning, maybe not right away, but something happens when we let God in. And I have a more prosaic saying, you know, things go better with Coke. Who remembers that old ad? Well, things go better with God. Things go better with God. And if we could just get that, if we could just get that God is always and only saying to us what Savannah sang at the beginning of this service, That you are beautiful. You are wise. You are loved and lovable no matter what icky thing you may be feeling or doing in any moment to the infinite. To the infinite, there is no ick. Write that down. (laughs) But I mean, there is nothing that can keep you from the love of God. Nothing. And if we weren't living in the times we were living in, we are living in now, that's probably where I would end the talk. But really, this is a like, please wake up to this. 
Please wake up to the idea that you can let God in everything. Please wake up to the idea that you are lovable and beautiful and noble within. And if you aren't there or don't feel like you're making progress there, see a practitioner, take one of the classes that you'll be hearing about after the service. Deepen in that, go read Ernest Holmes, who was the founder of this teaching, to really anchor in that. Because here's the thing, the world is demanding that we let a higher infinite intelligence into everything we be now. Have you noticed that trying to create a world that works for all is not happening very well? It is not happening very well. We need to bring, or it, maybe I'll just say it's incumbent upon us to bring that wisdom, which remember is intelligence and love married together. We need to bring that infinite wisdom into all areas of our life, into everything that we be, every stand that we take. Because the world is taking nothing less. One of my favorite terms or metaphors Ernest Holmes uses is that we are avenues, and you probably heard me say that, those of you who have heard me speak, we are avenues for God's expression. We can be tiny little, little paths, or we can be big, broad freeways for the expression of that wisdom, that grace, that compassion, that power, that knowing. That, and bringing that to everything, everyone, everywhere is holy, we start looking at the world differently. We start recognizing that Seattle is not more holy than Sudan. That Jerusalem is not more holy than Gaza. That I or any minister here or any of the rest here are no more holy than the homeless person we see on the street that what we do in our prayer chair is not more sacred and holy than what we do in the car, than what we do in the bedroom, than what we do in the bathroom. But what we do in our prayer chair is also not more sacred and holy than what we do in the voting booth, than what we do in a demonstration than how we choose to move and walk in the world. And so when we choose to open and allow God's presence in all areas, we can choose to be then a sacred driver, a sacred love maker, a sacred parent, a sacred voter, a sacred activist because we already come here and know that truly we are sacred livers we because we are spiritual livers so let's let god in every piece of it let's pray i invite you to breathe in and breathe out And just know that everything we require to be whole, we already know last week because the rabbi told us so. But because of who and what we are, expressions of the Most High God, we are fully able if we are willing to be expressions on the planet of that holiness as divine discernment divine wisdom divine compassion divine truth that includes all that we are free and able and equipped 
because of our divine inheritance to know and see everything as holy and therefore bring our full selves in with nothing left out with that divine presence as the guide and as that presence moving in us as us through us in every moment we create heaven on earth we create the peace we'd like to see we know that we are blessed and a blessing let's know that everything we do is holy now I give thanks for this knowing and I release this word letting it move on that law which only says yes and so it is